people were using Anglo-Saxon is renewing the covenant and renewing creation, and that the word of God Paul sees as the strand running right through all of that. So that's what I'm going to be doing. So to begin with, the word at work. The first letter to the Thessalonians is widely regarded as Paul's first extant writing. I don't actually agree with that judgment. I think Galatians was the first, but we'll let the point stand that it's not effective for what I'm talking about. In 1 Thessalonians, we find two passages in which Paul echoes the way that Acts was speaking. He speaks of the powerful divine word as a transformative energy, which, though it's unlimited, his own announcement of the gospel, so that when he announces the gospel, he's letting him slip a whole power thing. But the word is much greater than the sum of his own words or his own rhetorical skill. He says, quote, we know that God has chosen you because our gospel did not come to you but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in full conviction. And he says that you Thessalonians received the word 
in much suffering with joy inspired by the Holy Spirit, whereupon, as the larger world of northern Greece looked on in surprise at these strange goings on, quote, not only did the word of the Lord resonate out from you in Macedonia here, but in every place your faith in God has gone out. It might be possible to read that phrase, the word of the Lord, as the word about the Lord. It seems to be more natural to read it too as referring to the Lord's own word. The Lord is speaking through the word and things happen as a result which are more than the sum total of the human communicative exercise involved. So within those five verses in what some think is Paul's first ever letter, we have three aspects of the divine word. It comes upon people in power through the preaching of the gospel. It is received with both suffering and joy, and it resonates outwards from those newly formed communities. And there you have my subtitle in a nutshell, nutshell Gospel and Mission. They're all there in the first chapter of First Thessalonians. But there is more. In First Thessalonians 2, verse 13, Paul develops the theme further. He says, we always thank God, quote, that when you received the word which you heard from us, you received it not as the word of human beings, but as what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And as before, he goes on to say that something to us is very paradoxical, that the sign of all this is that they experienced as to us there's a sort of slippage in the logic there, but I think what it means is if the message had just been human advice, they might have found it an interesting just to hold in their heads, but not particularly dangerous, not particularly life-changing. But when a transformation occurs such that your former friends and neighbours are shocked into violent reaction, you know that this must be more than merely human wisdom. That might not be the kind of thing we look for today when we seek evidence of the power of the divine word. I'm always delighted when I think of the story of the bishop who said plaintively, everywhere St. Paul went, there was a riot. Everywhere I go, they serve tea. And <laughs> we don't expect the riots. Paul did. It's a good question as to why we don't, by the way. Anyway, Paul regularly spoke of it this way. And one of the key terms Paul uses in the second passage is the Greek word energeo, to be at work, to be providing energy. word. The word is energizing, it's at work within you. There are one or two other places where he uses the same word, and it's interesting to compare them. In Philippians 2, he declares that the one who is at work in you is God himself. Something is going on, something is stirring, something is happening, and it's because God himself is present and is at work. And in this proto-Trinitarian passage in 1 Corinthians 12, he says, there are varieties of gifts, but the same spirit, varieties of service, but the same Lord, and varieties of workings, energemata, but it is the same God who is working, ho energon, all of them in everyone. And this working, this strange hidden thing which God is energetically doing, contains two word-related ministries, words of wisdom and words of knowledge. And this enables us, I think, to offer a more rounded picture of what Paul means by the divine word being at He envisages a hidden divine energy which transforms lives and generates new activities, which in turn become part of the cascading, outflowing divine work in the world. These passages from Thessalonians, Philippians and uh, Corinthians already tell us that Paul believed in the personal presence and energy of the one true God being unleashed through the gospel and through its work in the dangerous transformation of human lives. Paul is not, in other words, simply constructing a system of theological thought, deciding to begin with the word, with scripture, rather than with something else, or images, or whatever. No, Paul's theology of the word is about a life-transforming energy which immediately results, not just in new ideas, 
but in new community. And this is strongly confirmed when we add in the perhaps more obvious starting points. In 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, Paul contrasts the gospel with the words of wisdom that you might hear from other teachers. The word of the gospel, he says, is different, not just in content, but in nature. It's a different sort of word, generating a different sort of knowledge and wisdom. He writes, the word of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is God's power. I sometimes try to rub students' noses in this one by getting them to imagine how when Paul arrived in Philippi or Thessalonica or Corinth or somewhere, he's, he, what he's basically trying to tell them is that there is a new Lord. The world has a new Lord. That's dangerous enough talk already. Who is this new Lord? Well, he's a Jew. Well, that's extremely counterintuitive for most people. Yeah. Um, and, and he was crucified. And now they know that Paul has obviously been, been either smoking something or drinking because crucifixion is the lowest place you can sink to in ancient honor shame cultures. Oh, but God raised him from the dead. And now they are completely sure that this strange little man who's come into town, uh, the sooner they get rid of him, the better. Because every element in that message is just stupid to the average person in the street. And to us who know these things from childhood, we have to defamiliarize ourselves sometimes in order to see just how shocking it all actually was. It's foolishness, of course it is, but to us who are being saved, it's God's power. And now it becomes clear, had there been any doubt, which there probably wasn't, what the word actually is. It's the message about the crucified Messiah. When he expands that early statement a few verses later, he says, Jews demand signs, Greeks look for but we proclaim the crucified Messiah, a scandal to Jews, folly to Gentiles, but called Jew and Greek alike, the Messiah who is the power and the wisdom of God. And this latter passage then expands that earlier statement, indicating that the word of the cross, the Logos to Stauru, is the announcement that the crucified Jesus is Israel's Messiah and the world's true Lord. And in the next chapter, he gives this message yet another spin. The mystery of God. When Paul makes his announcement, in other words, it's like a veil being drawn back so that the astonished onlookers see the first time what the hidden divine plan had always been. No one would have imagined that that's what God had in mind. And this is why Paul's message was, as he says, not in persuasive words of wisdom, but with the demonstration of the spirit and of power, so that the newfound faith would rest not on human wisdom, but on divine power. So we're clearly in the same territory as First Thessalonians, but with a lot more detail. And by now it should be clear as well that Paul, like Acts, uses the notion of the divine word as a shorthand for a much more complicated notion. In the proclamation of the gospel, the Holy Spirit is at work both to elicit faith and to accompany that with powerful signs and wonders on the one hand and with suffering on the other. So I said the suffering presumably arises from the fact that when people believe the gospel, they abandon former ways of life, including former cultic life, as in 1 Thessalonians 1, and therefore, inevitably, they're regarded as dangerous and subversive. The word generates a new kind of community which is bound to attract hostility. Now we can see as well the way in which what Paul says about the powerful word is a lot more than simply fresh content, fresh information upon which one might construct an intellectual system, even a theological system. The word in question creates a new reality. It brings a new world to birth. We can point towards this with illustrations. When a judge says, I find this person innocent, or a priest says, I declare that these two are husband and wife, a new reality comes into being. And in a different way, when someone says, I love you, especially if it's unexpected, something happens which is far more than the mere conveying of information. And all this goes with the theme which I and others have explored at length elsewhere, that for Paul, the gospel is about the sudden and dramatic fulfillment of the age-old divine purpose, which generates a new creation, a new world, 
in which there's not only new knowledge but a new type of knowledge, a type indeed for which one of the best names is agape, love. And here there are echoes of John and Hebrews and 1 Peter, the biblical theme of creation and new creation through the word. Come back to Paul. In Romans 1, that's one of the most obvious passages. When I thought of speaking on this, I went straight to Romans 1, partly because I live half my life in Romans anyway, but partly because it is the most obvious passage here. Romans 1, 16 and 17, Paul doesn't use the word word, but he's saying something very similar to the shame of the gospel because it is God's power to salvation to all who believe, Jew and Greek alike. And this is so because in it, God's righteousness is revealed. I'm going to be very restrained about God's righteousness tonight. That could take a lot longer. But the point is, again, the word for reveal, apocalyptotai, this is about a shocking and eruptive and disruptive event, which is also the thing which God always said he would do, the paradox of apocalyptic in Paul. Thus includes the note of surprising fulfillment as well as radical newness. And this points on to my second theme, which is the word and new creation. When we go back to the ancient biblical testimonies about the divine word, we find frequent reference to creation. By the word of the Lord were the heavens made and all the hosts of them by the breath of his mouth, Psalm 33. Going on a few verses later, he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood firm. This looks right back to Genesis 1, where the God of the Bible creates things by speaking, not by manipulating or fiddling around with previous odd material. He just says, and things come into being. The living, creating God is the God whose speech does things. It makes things. It brings things into existence. He sends out his command to the earth, says a later psalm. And this creational word is picked up by the covenantal word. He says his word to Jacob, his standard ordinances to Israel. And the divine word, 107, is even the agency by which God heals the sick. In all this, the divine word is very close to the divine wisdom. As in Proverbs 3, Proverbs 8, Psalm 104, wisdom is the mysterious quasi-personal agent through whom the creator makes all things. There is a confluence of ideas here in the Hebrew scriptures. Now, so far as I'm aware, Paul doesn't quote any of those passages directly, but there is one letter in particular where his notion of the active divine word deliberately invokes the idea of new creation, which I'm gonna suggest lies at the heart of his still deeper notion of community and mission. The letter to the Colossians, has creation and new creation as one of its main themes, with the famous poem of chapter 1, verses 15 to 20, offering a careful and subtle Christian meditation on Genesis 1 and Proverbs 8. The poem sees the Messiah as the hidden meaning both of the wisdom who was with the Creator at the beginning and of the beginning, Reshit, in Genesis 1 itself. So it's no accident that in the introduction to the letter, when Paul speaks of the word of truth, which is of the gospel, he ends this one, and this is what he says. He says, this word is bearing fruit and multiplying in all the world. And we recall that in Genesis 1, first the animals, then the humans are commanded to bear fruit and multiply, be fruitful and multiply. Paul is the creation story itself. And he's hinting that what is going on through the gospel is new creation. There is new creation happening at Colossae through the word doing its work. And this hint is magnified when, a few verses later, he reports his prayer that his hearers may themselves bear fruit and multiply in the knowledge of God. When they increase in knowledge and wisdom, that's one of the main things Paul wants to see. It's a, a great theme in Colossians. And Paul links this and his own role as a teacher to the underlying belief that the God whose powerful word people to faith in the first place is continuing to work in them through the word to bring them to maturity 
and a mature way of life. And in the Messiah, as we might have guessed from the great poem, are hidden, he says, all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And the word of truth which affects this, which brings people into this realization, is sharply contrasted with the deceitful words with which some might to try to distract the new converts. And when he describes his work of teaching and encouragement in Colossians 1.28, he doesn't explicitly speak of the divine word, but when he uses the same language about teaching and encouragement within the community later on in chapter 3, he does then talk about the word of God dwelling in so that for Paul, the divine word is the, the powerful energy which generates faith, so calls the church into existence in the first place, and also the powerful energy through the apostolic teaching, which is the Messiah, by which every member of the church is to be brought to maturity. And once again, though obviously the cognitive content of this word matters enormously to Paul, what matters above all is that through this teaching, the divine energy is at work. There is a sense of the presence of God doing what God wants to do in this community. So the passage I just hinted at, Colossians 3.16, holds the clue to Paul's vision of the ongoing work of building up the church. Quote, let the word of the Messiah dwell in you richly. Think about that indwelling. That's a word Paul uses in other places to talk about the church as the temple in whom the living God comes to dwell by the Spirit, and also the Christian as the one individually in whom the Spirit dwells in the temple. He also insists in Colossians 1 and 2 that the fullness of divinity has come to dwell in Jesus. So Jesus himself can have temple language ascribed to him, and the Christian individually or the Christian church and have temple language ascribed to them with the indwelling of the Spirit and now the indwelling of the Word. The two are very close. So once again, the divine Word is a periphrastic way of speaking about the living presence of God himself. In a sidebar, in my recent book, Paul and the Faithfulness of God, I have a whole chunk explaining in more detail than I had done before that in the Second Temple period, most Jews, when they thought about it, believed that though the Temple was still the place where the living God had chosen to put his name, the Shekinah, the glory, the glorious presence of God which Isaiah had seen, which was in Kings 8, which was there in the tabernacle in the wilderness in Exodus 40, the Shekinah which had left the Temple at the time of the Babylonian exile had not come back. And there's a paradox there. Of course, they still went to the temple. They still worshipped there. There was a sense of memory of, of the possibility of God showing up. But interestingly, in the later rabbis, when they compare the second temple with Solomon's temple, one of the things they say which was deficient about the second temple was that the Shekinah was not there. And that's actually well known among Jewish scholars. What seems to have happened in the New Testament, in very different ways, in John and Mark, and particularly in Paul, is the belief that the Shekinah has come back, but in and as Jesus and the Spirit. And Paul's theology of the Word is one way in which that is conveyed, the presence of the Word as the glorious and glorifying presence of God. Two other passages brief call for brief attention. In 17, Paul summarizes the way the gospel works. Faith comes through what is heard. What is heard comes through the word, the word of the Messiah. And he offers this as an explanation of Isaiah 53.1, near the start of the fourth servant song. But the phrase, the word of the Messiah, Rema Christu, is also linked to the quotation which follows from Psalm 19. Their sound has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the earth. The word of the Messiah is for Paul both the word about how the ancient messianic prophecies were fulfilled and the word that declares that the purpose of creation itself has now come to pass. Does this powerful word 
turn into the mission of the church. Here people regularly cite Philippians 2.16. The whole passage is about the holiness to which the church is called. The church is to be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish, in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, in which, Paul is here borrowing from the picture of the resurrected saints in Daniel 12, in which they will shine like lights in a dark world. They are to hold forth the word of life, at least according to some translations, but the meaning of the relevant word is debated. Epechontes, logon zoes, could mean holding forth the word of life, or it could mean, as in the NRSV, holding fast, keeping a tight grip on it. In the former case, holding forth, Paul would be seeing the church as the active agents of an evangelism which would be like his own, telling forth, holding forth the word of life to the world outside. But in the latter case, which seems marginally preferable on linguistic grounds, though the jury is still out on this one, he sees the church as holding tightly to the word of life so that they may continue to shine in the dark world so that it will be clear, he says, that he hasn't been wasting his time on them. But actually, with this second meaning, you, you get most of the first as well. So by holding tightly to the word, they will shine as lights in the darkness. The notion of mission is not far away, and I'll come back to that. All this leads now to some larger and wider Pauline reflections, which show, I think, that in Paul's underlying theology of the powerful divine word, he was retrieving some of the most important elements of Israel's ancient traditions and seeing them as coming to a new fulfillment through the gospel. It's easy when looking at a theme like the word of God in Paul to be quite pragmatic. Yeah, Paul preaches the gospel and stuff happens and so that's how it is. What I'm suggesting is it's actually organically related to some of the larger and often missed themes in his theology. So far in this lecture I've explored the ways in which Paul describes the work of the gospel in terms of the divine word, which I've suggested is for him a periphrastic way of referring to the powerful divine activity both in bringing people to faith and in transforming their lives. And I've proposed that we should see this from Paul's point of view in terms of the divine purpose of new creation in which the word calls things into existence that formerly didn't exist and thus fulfills the creator's long-term plan which had seemed to be thwarted by sin and death. And I've suggested that all this ties up with Paul's apocalyptic vision of a which is launched in Jesus and his death and death and which is put into operation through the gospel and which results not in knowledge of cognitive content but a new kind of, log uh, of knowledge, what some have called an apoc apocalyptic epistemology. And I now want to suggest that Paul also believed that this powerful divine word was the fulfillment of the powerful word of the biblical prophets. And behind that again, that it was in fact the long-awaited word through which the law itself, the ancient Torah, was to be fulfilled. These are large claims, and I must take them step by step. To begin with, Paul and the ancient prophetic traditions. It's well known that Paul's self-description borrows at various points from the prophetic call, not only of Jeremiah 1, but also more particularly of the so-called Second Servant Song in Isaiah 49. Here, the prophet speaks of God calling him from his mother's womb of his vocation to be the true Israel through whom God will be glorified, of his anxiety that he may have laboured in vain, of the vocation to be the light to the nations, of the time of favour and the day of salvation, and of those who wait for the Lord not being put to shame. Every single one of those lines has echoes in Paul, some of them frequent echoes, particularly the point about labouring in vain. When Paul says again and again, I was worried that I might have been working in vain, or you know that in the Lord your labour is not in vain, whatever. He is quoting a passage in Isaiah 49. The servant vocation is clearly a central part of his self-understanding, which is all the more interesting because you might think off the cuff that if Paul was thinking about the servant, 
he would think about Jesus as the fulfillment of Isaiah 53. And indeed, he does do that. But he also thinks of himself very clearly in terms of the servant of Isaiah 49. There's one particular passage where he quotes Isaiah 49, which has special relevance for my theme this evening. In 2 Corinthians 6, 2, he quotes Isaiah 49, verse 8, quote, At an acceptable time I have listened to you, and on a day of salvation I have helped you. Paul stops there, but the verse in Isaiah goes on, I have given you as a covenant to the people. Now, I've argued at length elsewhere that this is exactly what Paul means by 2 Corinthians 5.21b, might become the dikaiosune theu, the righteousness of God, the covenant faithfulness of God. Let me take this step by step. This is a bit complicated, but it's important. We know, of course, that the chapter division between 2 Corinthians 5 and 6 is arbitrary and much later is clearly carrying on the same train of thought, so don't worry just because there's a chapter division. More importantly, in 2 Corinthians 5, 18 to 21, and those of us who are engaged in pastoral ministry ought to find this passage absolutely central to what we do day by day. Paul is describing and explaining what he calls the ministry of reconciliation, the diaconia tes cataleges. He's explaining the nature of this vocation to the Corinthians. The Corinthians are offended because he's been in such trouble, in and out of jail, beaten up, all the rest of it. He's suffered so much and they're ashamed of him. We again who live after 2,000 years of honoring Christians who've suffered for their faith have to put ourselves back into the shoes of a, of a culture for whom that kind of suffering was simply shameful. No honor, no glory in it at all. Far from it, says Paul. What God did through the servant ministry of the suffering and dying Messiah, he is now implementing through the servant ministry of the suffering apostle. That's the point of that whole central section of 2 Corinthians. But as he approaches the end of chapter 5, he builds up his case in three carefully parallel double statement. First in verse 18, God reconciled us to himself through the Messiah and has given to us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, A, something God did through Jesus, B, the ministry which Paul has as And he expands this. Paul often does this, saying something simply, then just unpacking it a bit. Verse 19, in the Messiah, was reconciling the world to himself, and he was entrusting to us the logos cataleges, something God did through Jesus, followed by something God is now doing through Paul, and note that this ministry, this message, the Logos, the word of reconciliation. Again, the powerful word which does new things. And then he takes a verse out to explain that a bit more. God is making his appeal through Paul and his colleagues. Most translations of 520 say, we entreat you on the Messiah's behalf to be reconciled to God. But Paul doesn't say that. There's no you in this verse. He is not suddenly making an appeal for the Corinthians to be reconciled. That's not the point. They were reconciled to God a long time before. No, this is Paul's general description of what the word of reconciliation actually is. It is a word addressed to the whole wide world. Be reconciled to God. It is, in other words, the servant word, the word in to the Isaiahic servant. Then in verse 21, we have the third and last of the double statements. This is normally seen in terms of the wondrous exchange celebrated by Luther. Christ takes our sins and we receive his righteousness. But that's not actually what Paul says. Rather, this too is a double statement. First, of what God has done in the Messiah. Second, of the ministry which the apostle and his colleagues have as a result. So first... God made him to be sin who knew no sin. Yes, strong echoes of Isaiah 53. But second, so that in him we might become, might embody the divine covenant faithfulness. This is a statement of Paul's ministry. And again, with echoes of Isaiah 49 sounding very clearly, I have given you as a covenant to the people, says God, in the verse which Paul quotes 
a moment later, having just had another echo of Isaiah 49 in between. Don't accept God's grace in vain. It's another of those in vain statements. Now, okay, all this may seem detailed and technical, as indeed it is, but the point relates directly to the larger issue that we've just been discussing. For Paul, the divine word, here seen as the word of reconciliation which is entrusted to him, is the means of covenant fulfillment. It isn't simply a fresh word out of the blue without antecedent or any density of meaning. It's not merely a sudden address from a previously unheard of divinity, though for many pagans it may well have seemed like that. No, for Paul, the word in question is the long-awaited message through which the servant ministry at the heart of Israel's tradition is fulfilled at last. And when in Romans Paul says that the sudden unveiling of the gospel is witnessed to by the law and the prophets, I think this is central to the prophetic part of the Because for Paul, the powerful word through which the community of believing Jews and believing Gentiles is called into existence is the servant word, the reconciliation word, the covenant renewal word, the word which therefore tying in with Colossians, which is in many ways very close to 2 Corinthians, is the word also of new creation. Same passage, if anyone is in the Messiah, new creation. That's right before that sequence. Of course, the renewal of the covenant always pointed to the renewal of creation. If there were any doubt on that score, you should simply read the whole context of Isaiah 40 to 55, in which the powerful word, chapter 55, holds the whole poem together with the promise of the return of Yahweh to Zion to renew the covenant and thereby to renew creation, all through the work of the servant. For Paul, the word of the gospel of reconciliation is the word through which God does all that. That's the point of the fulfillment of prophecy. And here we come upon a vital point. For Paul, the idea of a powerful word was not simply a matter of understanding what we today call speech act theory, that you can say things and events happen. It corresponded to the ancient belief in the power of the prophetic word. The prophet's words carried divine power. Paul discovered that his preaching of the gospel did as well. What then about Torah? Everybody who studies Paul, and I know there are some seminarians here tonight, sooner or later comes to the question of Paul and the law. If I had $10 for every essay I have heard read to me on Paul and the law, I would actually be able to afford a very nice meal somewhere even in this town. <laughs> Many of us were taught the usual answers. Does Paul think the law is a bad thing, now happily abolished, or a good thing, now happily fulfilled? Some people think Galatians says the first and Romans says the second. That's far too shallow. Paul is a lot more subtle than that, as we might expect from the larger context of Second Temple Judaism. Torah was not monolithic. Above all, Torah was not just a set of commandments. Torah, as you can see if you sit down and read the first five books straight through, Torah was above all a narrative the story of creation and covenant of God, Adam, Abraham, Moses, Egypt, Israel, and shimmering in the distance but vitally important, the land, the inheritance. Torah is the story of how covenant restores creation, of how everything that went horribly wrong with Adam and Eve all the way to the Tower of Babel was, at least in principle, put right through Abraham's family through the exodus, through the ultimate promises. I, there's a wrinkle in there which I love. Uh, there's a sense in, in Genesis 1 to 11 that everybody knows that the human project ought to be about building community, building cities, and it all goes horribly wrong with the Tower of Babel. So they, they, they develop their families, they develop their cities, they develop their communities, and it's all shot through with, with wickedness and corruption and all the rest of it. Then God calls Abraham 
and says, we're going to start a family and I'm going to give you an inheritance. But it's a mark of the utter grace of that promise that Abraham is a childless nomad called to be the one through whom the family and the inheritance come about. Remarkable. But there's a problem with this story. God calls Abraham to undo and reverse the sin of Adam and its consequences. Adam and Eve were called to be God's partners in his creative work, his project for the world. They were to be the royal priesthood, reflecting God's stewardship and reflecting the, wor the worship of creation back to God. When they turned aside, though, God didn't say, OK, we'll scrub all that. God called a human family through whom to work his purposes of rescue, to get the creation project back on track. But God did say that the family who were going to be carrying the solution were also shot through with the problem. Abraham, called to undo Adam's sin, was also, in Pauline language, in Adam. And that's why, to cut a long story very short, the people who are rescued from Egypt quite soon go and make the golden calf. And it's why right at the end, in a passage by, quoted by Paul again and again, Deuteronomy 32, we find Moses declaring, even the Israel that has been redeemed from Egypt will go on getting it wrong to worship idols and to need chastisement and rebuke. You have to learn to read the Torah in this long sweep to understand what many Second Temple Jews, including Paul, were saying. But within this large sweep, near the end, we find the passage which Paul quotes in Romans 10 in particular. He cites Deuteronomy 30. The word is near you, on your lips and in your hearts. And this, he says, is the word of faith which we preach. Because if you confess with your lips Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. This passage has puzzled commentators because Paul seems to be doing some very fancy footwork with the passage about going up to heaven or going across the abyss or whatever. But Paul knows exactly what he's doing. Deuteronomy 30 is the climax of Torah. This is the moment when the covenant is renewed at last. Deuteronomy 27, 8 and 9, 9 how the covenant is going to work out we know from other Second Temple texts that other Jews were reading it like this at the time. If you obey, you'll be blessed and inherit the land. But if you disobey and worship idols, you'll be cursed and sent into exile. This is Deuteronomy 30. God will do the new thing, circumcising your heart, enabling you to love him and serve him truly, restoring you to your inheritance and enabling you at last to obey Torah. And then you will find that the commandment is not too high, not too low. The word will be near you, on your lips and in your heart, so that you may do it. Paul, you see, like some other Jews of his day, read Torah, Genesis to Deuteronomy, not simply as the backstory of Israel, but as the whole story, with the last chapters seen as a long-range prophecy of exile and final restoration. And in Romans 9 and 10, he's telling that whole story again, starting with Abraham, continuing with Moses, coming at last to the exile, and then to the Messiah. Romans 10, 4, the Messiah is telos nomu, the end of the law, the goal of the law, the point to which Torah was driving all along. And so, he quotes Deuteronomy 30, not arbitrarily, but exactly to the point. The word Deuteronomy says will be near you is for Paul the covenant renewing word, the heart transforming word, the inducing word, the word of the gospel, the word of the Messiah, the Lord. All the first half of the lecture about Paul's theology of the word comes rushing in here as the fulfillment of the strange, long purposes of Torah. If Paul sees the path as the fulfillment of prophecy, he also sees it as the fulfillment of Torah. God, in other words, has done the radical new thing which he always promised. And in the word of the gospel, this new thing springs into life, a life which, as he says earlier, the law wanted to give but couldn't because of the weakness of the flesh. 
And the divine word thus summed up law and prophets alike, not just cognitively, though that too, but narratively, in that the long story that both were telling had reached its telos in Israel's Messiah, through whom the covenant was fulfilled and creation therefore renewed. And it is that double fulfillment that leads me into the final section of this lecture. I have argued that for Paul, the powerful divine word is both the word of the gospel, the announcement about Jesus and his death and resurrection, proclamation that he is Israel's Messiah and therefore the world's true Lord, and also the fulfillment of Israel's long hope, shaped by Torah and prophets. In this Messiah, the covenant in his resurrection and through the gospel itself, creation is renewed as well. If anyone is in Messiah, new creation. That, of course, is paradoxical and partial, awaiting the final resurrection for its completion. But for Paul, it has been decisively launched in the resurrection. And this is the framework for the larger understanding of gospel, community, and mission to which I now return. For the community of the Messiah's people were called into being by the powerful word of the gospel and were to be built up in faith and wisdom and understanding by that same word, seen as having specific cognitive content, but deeper than that, as conveying the divine transformative energy. I'm going to do it again, four long words, in if. The word was declarative, saying what had already happened. Performative, saying what it meant. Performative, bringing into being a new state of affairs. And transformative, affecting in humans, in together, the new creation of which it spoke. Declarative, informative, performative, transformative. But for Paul, part of the whole work of the powerful divine word. And therefore, not only in Philippians, but all through, Paul sees the community that is called into being by this powerful word as the pilot project of new creation. In Ephesians, he speaks of the church, the multicolored, many-dimensioned church, as being the sign to the principalities and powers that Jesus is Lord. In Galatians, the church called into being by the truth of the gospel is a single community of Jew and Gentile together, which has left behind slavery under the stoichia, the elements of the world. In Romans, the church is the people who share the doxa of the Messiah, that is, his glorious rule over all the world. At the moment, they share it through the deep paradoxes of suffering and the prayer which cannot get beyond groaning with the pain of the world but that's part of the point it is the people of new creation who are to live by the powerful word at the heart of the creation that is longing to be free from its own slavery to decay the church is to be the sign and by its prayer the means of that creation's renewal of course you can parody this you can and then dismiss it. People sometimes speak of, oh, are you saying that the church is simply building the kingdom by our own efforts? Of course not. That's not the point. The church is to be the community in which the signs of new creation, particularly of unity across traditional boundaries and of a holiness which instantiates some of those central themes of Torah. It's interesting. I was reading Jonathan Clowen's book on purity and and uh, holiness on the plane coming over. And he emphasizes again and again that in terms of temple purity, there are three basic things which get in the way of purity or destroy it, idolatry, sexual immorality, and murder. And again and again, we see idolatry, sexual sin, and hatred, or the malice which goes with it, as things which Paul says, that is stopping you being the people you're supposed to be. Rather, the divine word creates a united community which demonstrates that there is indeed a new way to be human and with that a new future for the whole creation. 
I think it'd be obvious that this vision of new creation is very different from the traditional Western model, whether Catholic or Protestant, in which the real point is to leave the present world and go somewhere else, perhaps heaven. There's a long debate as to whether the platonic influence of dogma has been healthy or not. I suspect it's clear from what I've said tonight and from what some of you know about my other writing that I think it's largely been unhealthy, though I know that's controversial. The ancient biblical view of creation was that it was good, God-given, and to be affirmed. And the Christian view is that creation has been rescued and renewed from idolatry and corruption through Jesus, the Messiah, and that through the powerful word of the gospel, that message of renewal and the reality of which it speaks has been let loose in the world. Not to abandon creation or to escape from it, but precisely to renew it from within. And the church which lives by the powerful word of the gospel is to be the people of new creation. Not only new creation in its own life, but the cause of new creation in the world, of reconciliation. Thank God for the wonderful work that the church has done and is doing in that area. Of beauty, naturally. Paul says in Ephesians that we are God's artwork. Of justice, certainly because by the gospel we are justified, put right, in order to be a sign and a means of God's intention to put the whole world right at last. Of evangelism, of course, because the gospel word is precisely the good news that through Jesus, God has dealt with all that corrupts and destroys the world and human life and has launched his new world in which one day God himself will be all in all. This then, is the powerful word which Paul spoke and about which he spoke. And as we look outward to the large of the word of God for today and tomorrow, it must be at the heart, of course, of all that the church is and does. And when we look with Pauline eyes at the whole canon of scripture and see how Torah and prophets come together into this new word, we may perhaps ways some of the sterile antitheses which have for so long made life difficult in the Western Church. I haven't mentioned the Gospels or Revelation or indeed the Psalms much, but I say that the Bible as a whole is designed to work in the same way that the powerful word works for Paul. It too is declarative, informative, performative, and transformative. It too transcends the small rationalist boxes into which both conservatives and skeptics have so often tried to squash it. If we say that the Bible carries divine authority, we're not saying it's just an encyclopedia in which we can go and look up a lot of true facts. We are saying that it is the story in which all our stories are contained, including the story of how our Christian predecessors have read it, tradition. It is the work of art through which we ourselves become God's artwork, so that we can then produce fresh artwork in the world. It's a sign of new creation. It is the story of God is putting the whole world right, within which is contained the story of our own putting right, so that we can share in God's larger project. If, in short, we are looking for a biblical theology of the Bible, for what the Word itself says about a theology of the Word, we must think in terms of the great narrative of creation and covenant, and then of new and new creation, and of the powerful word at the heart of every moment and stage of that story. And we must then learn to read it and teach it privately, liturgically, prayerfully, together, as what it is, not as what it isn't. And we must hope and pray that in this and every generation, God will raise up people who will, in their turn, be servants of God, themselves transformed and bringing transformation to God's world. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop Wright. What a moving lecture profound, inspire us, motivate us.
Thank you for being here. This is a privileged night. Uh, the bishop has accepted to take a few questions and answers. There is a microphone there. Uh, if you will only have time for five short questions, and uh, if you could approach the microphone and identify yourself, that would be helpful. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin. It's a pleasure. A very Paulist type question. I mean, I've run into Christian friends who seem to think that the Old Testament is virtually um, barely on the other side of the spectrum. I find some that seem to be stuck in a uh, kind of a groundhog day of just continuing the Old New Testament without thinking of any really, I think, understanding Christocentric transformative power of, of Christ and the church. So my question to you is, where do you think the missing or misconstrued understandings of our relations of the church and of, of Christ with with the Hebrew <coughs> traditions. What do you think is is the missing piece, and, and how do you think we can resolve it in a way that can help uh, not only ecumenism but understanding our own faith as Christians? Yeah, it's a huge question. Thank you, um, and I understand it only too well because actually that question is on the table from the first century onwards. One of the reasons Paul writes Romans is to try to navigate exactly that fine line. He's drawing in Psalms, Prophets, Writings, Torah particularly, into the great narrative which has Christ and the Spirit of it, while saying to the Roman Church, um, the largely Gentile Roman Church, don't you forget these Jewish traditions, this is actually your story and you've been grafted into it. And it's difficult for the in different generations, in different ways actually, to hold on to that. So you, you have some who um, become Ebionites and think that actually this is with Jesus sort of tacked on the end vaguely, and some become Marcionites and think you can cut the Old Testament out. Um, for myself, um, the thing I found most helpful is doing an extensive exercise that I was doing in ministry tonight, which is to look at Paul's detailed quotations, and you could do the same with John, you could do it with Matthew or Mark, they're, they're all different but all on the same map, or Hebrews or Revelation. Look at the way that they use Israel's scriptures, and the, way, the subtle ways, it's not straightforward, there's no one size fits all of a sort of hermeneutical theory that you can just say that's what they're doing. But in so many different ways, they're exploring the whole thing as a story. And though I didn't emphasize this this evening, I would stress as an Exodus story. Jesus chose Passover as the moment to go to Jerusalem and do what had to be done, knowing what was going to happen. And the early church saw the entire Exodus event with all its different ramifications from the plagues on Egypt through to the wilderness wanderings and beyond as the narrative in which they were now being caught up. And if you do that, somehow I think that will help you get your bearings. So think Exodus narrative, reread the text with that in mind. But there's all sorts of other things out there, lots of pitfalls as well. Uh, I'm a young pastor and I'm gonna call on an aspect of your character that's not up here, scholar, professor, or author. I'm gonna call on your pastoral counseling. And as a young pastor, as we see the powerful word of God working in Genesis 1, God says, and it is. We see the powerful word of God raising Jesus from the dead. How would you encourage a young pastor who is ministering the gospel, preaching this powerful word, and the what we're up against, the obstacles to overcome, that word has to overcome to see lives changed and transformed, what kind of counsel would you give to a young pastor? Uh, massive. Um, uh, the, the, uh, I am frequently advice would you give to seminarians or young clergy, and I just go back to the basics, and I find it surprising when people say to me afterwards, and I've had this experience many times, I'm so glad you said that because we need to be reminded. It's basically, you need to be soaked in scripture, you need to know how to pray your socks off, and you need to know how to love people doing those three things, then whatever context you're in, stuff is going to happen. The power of God will be there. But we have to remind ourselves that the power of God, the kingdom of God, is what is defined in the Sermon on the Mount. When God wants to transform the world, he doesn't send in the tanks, he sends in the meek and the brokenhearted and the hungry for justice people and the, the people who uh, are pure in heart and all the rest of it. 
And by the time the bullies and the bad guys and the people who are carving up the world between them have woken up and found out what's going on, the meek and the humble and the mourners and all the rest of it have built hospitals and are running ministering to the poor and making real transformation powerfully happen. That, and, and this is all, of course, cross-shaped. Um, the power is the usual worldly power, it's the cruciform power. So I suppose that the key text for that might be Mark 10, 35 to 45. James and John say, we want the power right and left. And Jesus says, are you quite so sure you want to sit at my right and left? Uh, because this is about Calvary. Um, and, and so he says, he says, the rulers of this world do power one way, we're going to do it the other way. And that is hugely demanding for a young pastor, for an old pastor, and for that pastor's family and all the rest of it. But there's no life like it. Go for it. I can see two more questions emerging. Yes. Or at least one. Uh, another pastoral question. Um, you've been quite clear on the issue of same-sex relationships, that you don't think that um, God same-sex relationships. Um, and my question is, how do you see a, a vision of the church ministering to people with same-sex attractions, um, specifically the 40% of homeless youth that are LGBT, uh, and the one in three uh, LGBT teens that have attempted suicide? I just, that really is at, the, at my yeah, heart. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you. Yes, I've, I've inevitably, because half of my practicing ministry has been among students and young people, so I've had most of the questions that you might come across your study um, threshold have come through my study door. Um, so I'm, I'm reasonably used to this. I think one of the things we forget, and as pastors we, we actually know in our hearts but don't always recognize, is that most adults some of the time, and some adults most of the time, have a struggle with deep felt, deeply felt sexual desires, whether because they're married but keep, falling in, keep on falling in love with other people even though they don't want to, or because they're celibate by and find that there's huge dangerous attractions in various places, or what. And this has a whole range of things, and it isn't just same-sex attraction, it's people of, of, who have experienced all sorts of attraction. The other thing to say is that as a pastor, I really do want to say this, and I could quote you some fairly striking examples, that sexual attraction changes over time, and that to label yourself, to give yourself an identity, to say, this is what I very deeply feel, therefore, this is who I am, is actually a denial of, of, of Roman 6, of baptism. That the only identity a Christian has is to be en Christo, and the Christian life is a struggle to figure out what that means and to renounce all the other identities, cultural, economic, etc., etc., which claim our attention as though I can actually be defined in lots of other ways as well. And so I want to put the whole question on a much larger canvas, and I think part of the problem with our focus on this particular issue is that we are allowing ourselves to meet this particular issue in the way that the world wants us to meet it, rather than in the larger framework that we ought to. Having said all of that, of course, every pastor knows there are heartrending situations. And uh, I could tell you about an attempted suicide that I was um, aware of just, just recently. Um, that's a cry for help or a cry of despair. Lots of people cry for help and lots of people despair over many, many things, including all sorts of things most Christian partners would, pa pastors would say you shouldn't actually have been longing for that, and if you were, then, you know, we need some serious help. So those things by themselves don't constitute, as it were, a legitimation. Part of our problem here is that within postmodernity, the only ethical argument that is regularly allowed is the squeal or scream of the victim. So everyone is sort of saying, I'm a victim, I'm hurt, I'm this, I'm that. And it's not a good way to do ethics. And, and unless we have wiser ways of doing ethics, as pastors. Now, I, th this is a huge issue. You know, I do. Um, but those are some of the places I would start. People say to me, when are you going to write about this? The answer is, I'm not an expert on this. I've not. I've read some of the literature, but there's masses I haven't read. And I am aware that this is, as it were, a perfect storm right now in your culture and mine. There are several quite different things which are going on culturally, sociopolitically, um, in all sorts of ways, and to deal sensitively with the issue in the middle of that would demand a serious and careful attention to several different, maybe a dozen or two, 
different issues in order then to arrive at some wisdom in the middle. So most of us just kind of hang in there and hope that by trying to be prayerful and humble and pastoral, we, we can actually navigate through. Thank you. Is there maybe one more? Ah, yes, there is. One. Let's, let's just take this. I was just wondering how you would approach um, a non-believer if you would introduce right away, you know, the glory and beauty of the word versus, you know, provide for us an example of Christ. Thank you. Yes, it depends entirely who the person is and where they're coming from. And I, like most people who occasionally wear a collar of this sort, have been approached on trains by people who say, will you tell me what it is you do and why and so on. And you have to judge very quickly, how much can I actually say to this person? How much will they take in? But something about Jesus, sooner or later, has to be at the centre of it. At the same time, sometimes one can actually, depending on the audience, say that without coming full on at it. And I have found in many situations that I think, uh, okay, I, I really need to tell this person about Jesus. And then I find myself talking about justice or talking about beauty or talking about wisdom or talking about pain. And Jesus may come in, but as it were, once we got some groundwork so that the name of Jesus isn't just dropped in like a bomb into the conversation. At other times, I was doing a debate on, goodness, last Wednesday night in Yale with the philosopher Shelley Kagan, who is an atheist philosopher who basically an Epicurean, he believes that death is absolutely the end, etc. We had a 90-minute full-on debate in front of a large audience in Yale, which was very exciting. And we were supposed to be talking about death and what we believed about life after death or not and what difference that would make. Almost immediately, he started saying things for which the only answer was to talk about Jesus. So I talked about Jesus. So he came right back at me about questions about the Gospels and about resurrection. So at least half the discussion was like, so you just can't tell. It depends entirely who the person is. But in general, the, the, the Christian answer is not vague theories about things, but the fact is all the vague theories suddenly came rushing together and took a human form and died on a cross and rose again. And somehow we have to find appropriate, loving, wise, culturally sensitive ways of saying that, ways of naming it, into a culture that still thinks it knows him, but often actually doesn't. Dear friends, uh, if you want to deepen in the writings of Bishop Wright, we have a series of his work right behind this room in the atrium. You could go there and take a look at the titles and purchase uh, this important work that the bishop has developed for all these years. Now it is the time to celebrate this wonderful evening, and I would like to invite all of you on behalf of America Magazine, the leading Catholic National Review publication, uh, I want to invite you on behalf of Father Matt Malone and myself to the second floor. Uh, we have prepared wonderful, delightful, you no know, goodies from the biblical time. <laughs> so please. Join us on the second floor. You walk all the way out and go up the stairs. Uh, a wonderful time, and you will have an opportunity to say hello to Bishop Wright. Thank you, thank you, Father Matt Malone, for making the sacrifice to join us tonight. Good night. <laughs> <laughs>